Today, we're going to be looking at the music of the great Hungarian composer Franz Liszt. Liszt was an eccentric but brilliant character, one of the greatest pianists in history. But he had a life that stayed on, on track, as it were. Yeah, towards the end of his life, he was actually very devout. He took minor orders. But going back to the middle of his life, when he was a young boy, he was sitting in the audience and he witnessed Berlioz's premiere of his Symphony Fantastique. This relationship between Liszt and Berlioz would later flourish, with, and that would lead to Liszt actually dedicating the work we're going to discuss today to Berlioz. But let's go back a bit. The, the, the work we're going to be looking at is Liszt's setting of Faust, his Faust symphony. The legend of Faust was not unique to Liszt, and it was actually quite old. But interestingly, unlike many of the other legends in Europe, which could be traced back thousands of years, this fast was actually based on a real person. The, the character called Johann Faustus lived in 15th century Germany. He would wander around the region of Thuringia. And in fact, somehow his travels led to his attaining a doctorate degree from the University of Heidelberg. And he was an intellectual, a rationalist, a philosopher. But legend was that he had sold his soul to the devil. And, and there was this idea that excessive rationalism, excessive education led to corruption in a sense. Perhaps there was something to be said for blind faith. But uh, Faustus was an intellectual. And the story goes that Mephistopheles, who was the devil, in a sense, tempted him with sensual pleasures. Uh, he introduced Faustus to Gretchen, an attractive young lady, and in the poem, which was set much later in the 1770s by the great German romantic poet Goethe, Goethe writes out the poem. He, he wrote the first part, published in the early 1800s, and then the, the second part was published in the 1830s. The first part we see how Faustus is introduced to Gretchen and he continues to woo her and to, to seduce her leading to Gretchen's room. And in the second part, published much later, we see that Faustus feels bad, he feels remorseful and he atones for what he's done. And ultimately Gretchen intercedes in his half and in the final chorus the angels carry him up to heaven and this actually portrays each of the characters musically in each movement. He doesn't stick in a strict sense to Goethe's poem. Rather, in each of the four movements of the symphony, he portrays each of the characters in terms of their personalities. So we see in the first movement, he depicts Faustus with a 12-tone setting, which uh, was a manifestation of his complex personality, his excessively rationalistic personality, in the second movement, the music is sweet. It depicts Gretchen. In the third movement, we see that each of the fastest themes, depicting all the different facets of his personality, is distorted in some way. And this makes up a rather grotesque scherzo, which embodies uh, Mephistopheles, the devil. And in the fourth movement, there is a choral setting. There is a, a, a male choir and there's a tenor. And ultimately, the, the choir sings this Corvus Mysticus, in which we see that Faustus' uh, soul is carried up to heaven by the angels. So a very fantastical setting. But this was actually what was in vogue at the time. We have to remember that the romantic movement in the arts and the music and the literature appealed to the newly emerging middle class. We know that industrialization was an important force. And in fact, this increased wealth led to this middle class that was more educated and the idea of the rationalistic Faustus with his rejection of religious dogma actually appealed to them. So they, Goethe's poem found a sympathetic audience in the middle class of the time. And we're going to look at each of the movements and see how Liszt succeeds in depicting the characters of the Faustus story. And Liszt, of course, looked at Goethe's poem. He looked at the French translation. He was introduced to the poem by Berlioz. It was this friendship between Liszt and Berlioz. 
and uh, he ultimately dedicated the work to Bernier. He started sketching it out in 1854, and three years later, at the premiere, uh, he dedicated the work to Berlioz. He had already finished the first three movements early on, and later on he added the last movement. And we're going to look at the movements of Liszt's Fausto Symphony in more detail. Liszt was introduced to the first part of Goethe's Faust poem at a young age by the composer Hector Berlioz, whose acquaintance he had made a number of years earlier. Liszt was enticed by the narrative of this poem and sketched out some ideas first for an opera and then for a symphony. However, the idea remained on hold until he had settled in Weimar in 1854, which was also appropriately Goethe's adopted hometown. Over a period of two months, he composed and orchestrated the first three movements of his Faust symphony. He dedicated the work to Berlioz and added the finale with its tenor soloist and male voice choir for the work's premiere three years later. Rather than following Goethe's complex narrative, Liszt presents each of the work's first three movements as a portrait of one of the main protagonists. Here we can hear the beginning of the first movement. It portrays the multiple layers of Faust's restless nature in a complex 12-tone setting. Here we can hear the beginning of the second movement, which depicts Gretchen's sweet nature. Here we can hear the beginning of the third movement, which is a scherzo. This movement presents each of the themes which was used earlier to depict Faust, but this time in a distorted form. Here we can hear the beginning of the final movement. It is a radiant choral setting of Goethe's Chorus Mysticus. Here, Gretchen's theme leads fast soul into a heavenly realm portrayed by ethereal music. <laughs> 